Hello everyone and welcome back to another lecture on post-colonial literature. Uh, today we will again uh, pick up the notion of uh, belonging simultaneously to multiple cultural traditions uh, which we discussed in our previous lecture while talking about cosmopolitanism. And uh, in today's lecture we will explore this idea of multiple cultural affiliations with reference to what is called diasporic literature. And this category of diasporic literature uh, has come to form an integral part of the broader category of post-colonial literature. And in order to understand this concept of diasporic literature, what this umbrella term diasporic literature signifies, uh, I think we should start by defining for ourselves the term diasporic itself, that adjective. Now diasporic is an adjective that is derived from the noun diaspora and this noun diaspora has its roots in the Greek language. Now the word in its Greek form means dispersion and scattering of seeds during the process of sowing. So it primarily in its original form related to the uh, field of agriculture. However, today the primary understanding of diaspora has changed and today it relates to the dispersion of people rather than seeds. And this specific association of the concept of diaspora with the dispersion of people rather than with seeds can be traced back, for instance, to the book of Deuteronomy in the Old Testament of the Bible, where in chapter 28, verse number 25, we find the use of the Greek root word for diaspora. And there it is used to describe how if the commandments of the God is not followed, then the God will cause the disobedient people to uh, be defeated by their enemy and the God will cause them to be dispersed from their homeland and to be scattered among all the kingdoms of the earth. Now, while looking at this occurrence, early occurrence of this word diaspora in the Old Testament uh, which is used to mean a dispersion of people, we need to keep in mind that here the idea of diaspora is closely associated with the notion of exile or of being removed from one's homeland as a form of punishment. And this connection between exile and diaspora most strongly resonates in the history of the Jewish community which was banished from its homeland in the 6th century BCE after the holy city of Jerusalem was sacked and the temple of Solomon was destroyed by the Babylonian king Nebuchadnezzar. Now this exile this 6th century BCE exile and the memory of this exile uh, still informs Jewish identity and is an integral part of the cultural memory of the Jewish diaspora. That is, um, uh, the Jewish people who live in different parts of the world dispersed from their homeland. And this sense of exile within the Jewish community is closely entwined with a sense of nostalgia. A sense of nostalgia for the lost homeland and a desire to return to it. Now all these emotional and cultural associations that I have just described to you, uh, referring back to the Old Testament, to the Jewish history, all of these shape our present understanding of the term diaspora. And uh, let me 
before I proceed any further, let me reiterate the main points uh, again with regards to diaspora so that we know that we have clearly understood the term diaspora and its various connotations. So, what is diaspora? Firstly, diaspora refers to communities of people living away from what they consider to be their homelands. Secondly, this state of living away from their homeland bears the negative connotation of being in exile. And thirdly and finally, the feeling of being in exile evokes within the diasporic community a sense of nostalgic longing for a lost homeland and a desire to somehow return to that homeland which has been lost. Now, keeping in mind this general characterization of diaspora and diasporic identity, let us now try and see how it relates to post-colonialism and post-colonial literature because ultimately that is our main concern in this course. Well, as discussed at the very beginning of this lecture series, colonialism connects the two distant spaces of the metropolis and the colonial periphery through a constant traffic of goods, of capital, but most importantly of people. So, in other words, human dispersion and formation of diasporic communities are integral to the process of colonialism itself. Now, in our previous lectures, we have already discussed a bit about the white man who is removed from his homeland in the metropolis and who comes to the colonial periphery, to the colony of the metropolis. And uh, here I am thinking about our discussion of characters like Marlowe in uh, Joseph Conrad's Heart of Darkness, someone who comes to Congo, the colonial periphery from the metropolis, Belgium. Um, and I am also thinking, for instance, of the Christian missionaries as depicted in Chinua Achebe's novel, Things Fall Apart, uh, who again are people who have come to Nigeria, the colonial periphery, from the mother country in Europe. Uh, but today in our lecture, we are going to discuss an opposite kind of migration, an opposite kind of dispersion that the colonialism uh, gave birth to. And this is the dispersion of the colonized subjects, not the representative of colonial power like Marlowe or uh, the Christian missionaries, but the dispersion of colonized subjects from their homelands. And, uh, the migration of these people from the colonial periphery to the metropolis. However, uh, before uh, we deal with that, it is again important to uh, remember that not every dispersion of colonial subjects from their homelands meant a gathering in the European mother country or in the western metropolis. Uh, many people were simply displaced during colonialism from one area of the colonial periphery to another, from one colony to another. And here, for instance, we uh, have already um, discussed this when we uh, discussed Derek Walcott, but I am thinking, for instance, of the uh, dispersion of slaves and indentured laborers uh, during colonialism from places like India, for instance, and Africa. And these dispersed laborers and slaves and uh, sort of bonded laborers, they were gathering, they were being dispersed from 
colonies like India and Africa, but they were gathering not necessarily in the metropolis, but they were gathering in another part of the colonial periphery like for instance the Caribbean, where these bonded laborers, these slave uh, labor was necessary to uh, run the sugar plantations for instance. Now, as I said, we have already uh, discussed this particular kind of migration when we talked about Derek Walcott. And Walcott, if you remember, uh, is the legacy bearer of the As African uh, diasporic community who gathered in the Caribbean during the days of slavery. After slavery was banned during uh, the early 19th century, indentured laborers took their places. And uh, the Indian novelist Amitabha Ghosh in his Ibis trilogy, uh, especially in the first novel in the Ibis trilogy, Sea of Poppies, he describes in details how these indentured laborers were gathered from various parts of India, for instance, uh, using different degrees of coercion and persuasion. And uh, then they were shipped to distant colonies, uh, distant colonial plantations to work as bonded laborers. And uh, to give you an example, the ancestors of the Nobel Prize winning uh, Caribbean author uh, V. S. Naipaul they migrated from India to Caribbean in this similar fashion to serve in the plantations there. And in fact, Naipaul uh, in his uh, writings give a very vivid glimpse into the ways of life of diasporic community of Indians that started taking shape in the Caribbean from the 19th century. However, these dispersions of uh, colonized subjects within the colonial periphery was also supplemented by significant waves of migration that reached from the colonies to the metropolis. And let us take for instance uh, the relation between the metropolitan Britain and the colonized India. Indians started arriving in Britain from uh, South Asia, different parts of South Asia really, as early as the 17th century. And uh, they were, these people who were arriving um, in Britain during the early days uh, were primarily servants employed by British households, but they were also sailors, diplomats and savants. One of the most interesting Indian migrants to Britain during this early period was a man called Sheikh Deen Muhammad and uh, Deen Muhammad was born in Bihar in uh, 1759 and he migrated to Britain in 1782 and there he introduced what he referred to as shampoo baths and he also introduced Indian cuisine in Europe uh, while uh, becoming the first Indian author to publish a book in English. And this book, which was published in 1794 under the title The Travels of Deen Mahomet, uh, is simultaneously regarded as the first major work of Indian English writing, Indian English literature, as well as the first major work of Indian diasporic literature in English. Now, the group of servants, sailors and diplomats were soon supplemented and then almost overshadowed by the population of Indian students who started arriving in Britain from India uh, from around the 1840s. And uh, this migration that started during the 1840s has not stopped yet. Um, and it is interesting to note that many of our Indian nationalists like M. K. Gandhi for instance, Subhash Chandra Bose, Jawaharlal Nehru, B. R. Ambedkar, they all went to Britain for their higher studies. Uh, so this connection between India and Britain and the migration of students from uh, the colonized India to the colonial metropolis in Britain. Uh, has played a really very significant role in the history both of Britain and of India. Now, uh, 
these various waves of migration from the colonial periphery to the mother country established a number of diasporic communities within the metropolis. And the category diasporic literature refers to the literature produced by these displaced people who migrated from the uh, colonial periphery in the global south and who gathered in the metropolitan centers in the global north. And we need to note here that these metropolitan centers that we are talking about not only includes uh, places like Britain or France or Spain, but it also includes America um, uh, today because America in many ways have inherited the mantle of the colonial West. Now, as a literature that reflects the displaced condition of its author, diasporic writing is expectedly uh, informed by the pangs and pains of, of exile and it is also informed by a nostalgic desire to reunite with the homeland uh, that has been lost during the migration. And this sense of exile and nostalgia forms the keynote which unites the otherwise mind-bogglingly wide variety of diasporic literature produced in Britain, France, Spain, America by people coming from different parts of the world like India, Africa, uh, Latin America, the Caribbean islands. So, in our lecture today, we will try and understand this wide variety of uh, literature that is categorized under the title of diasporic literature uh, by focusing on one particular instance. It is a story by uh, the author Jhumpa Lahiri and by focusing on that short story, uh, it is a very poignant and very beautiful short story, we will come to that shortly, but in focusing uh, on that short story, our intention would be to identify the key concepts of exile and nostalgia, uh, nostalgia for the homeland that informs the diasporic condition in general and diasporic literature in particular. But uh, before we move on to the story, let me introduce the author to you. Jhumpa Lahiri was born in 1969 in London and uh, she was born to Bengali parents who had migrated from Calcutta. But uh, Jhumpa Lahiri was not uh, really brought up in England. She was raised primarily in the east coast of United States where her parents migrated when she was only two. Uh, more recently, Lahiri has shifted base again and now she resides with uh, her husband and two children in Rome, the capital of Italy. And this diasporic identity of Lahiri, this history of migration and exile has created for her a unique location in the interstices or in the gaps of different cultures and she identifies herself as writing from a position of marginality where limits of different cultures meet or if they do not meet, they leave a very interesting gap from within which one can look at these different cultures and combine various elements and write about them. But nevertheless, we also need to understand that this marginality, this interstices represents a gap, a sense of lack, a sense of loss. And we understand this sense of lack and sense of loss from Lahiri's own um, writings and interviews about herself um, where she says that for instance though she was born to uh, Bengali parents, uh, her knowledge of Bengali is only partial and this sense of lack of her partial knowledge of her mother tongue has uh, 
informed her cultural identity. On the other hand, though Lahiri was brought up in America, her desire to keep alive her connection with uh, her Bengali roots has meant that Lahiri uh, could only partially assimilate herself within America. And Lahiri's move to Italy has only accentuated this sense of uh, being a marginal entity who does not fully belong to any one particular culture and who cannot firmly identify any one place as her home. Now, this sense of being without a fixed cultural as well as spatial home strongly informs all of uh, Chumpa Lahiri's works, be it her novels like uh, The Namesake or The Lowland or her uh, celebrated collection of short stories like um, Interpreter of Maladies or uh, the more recent one uh, titled Unaccustomed Earth. But whereas the state of being an exile informs Lahiri's writings with a sense of lack and loss, it also informs them with a tremendous sense of multicultural possibilities. Again, as I said, the interstices, the margin, the, the gap between the culture, uh, it is a gap, therefore it signifies a lack, a loss, a sense of not belonging to any of the cultures. But again, that gap, that interstices is also filled with multicultural possibilities. It is a position from which one can borrow, one can appropriate elements from different cultures, right? And this is what happens with uh, Jhumpa Lahiri too, because by freeing oneself from the confines of one's homeland and one's native culture, the condition of being an exile can make a person an heir to all cultures in the world. By not belonging to any one culture, you actually become an heir to all cultures and that opens a tremendous amount of possibilities of bringing together eclectic cultural elements to shape your own identity. And uh, such a stance, such a possibility is realized by Lahiri in her attempt, for instance, to learn Italian, the language of the country that she now resides in. And uh, she is trying to make both that language, that culture and that country her own now. And in her latest book uh, titled In Altre Parole, uh, which is originally written in Italian, but uh, which has been translated in English under the title In Other Words, gives us an account of this difficult and rewarding attempt to appropriate for oneself a language and culture to which one is neither born nor exposed to while growing up. Jhumpa Lahiri's life and literature therefore shows the cultural possibilities that the condition of being born and brought up in a diaspora throws up. But Lahiri is also keenly aware of the sense of alienation that this diasporic condition entails. And the migration from one's homeland can make one an heir to multiple cultures, yes, that is a possibility. But Lahiri realizes that it can also as easily shut one out from all sense of cultural rootedness. And the claustrophobic sense of a cultural vacuum that a migration from the homeland can create for an individual is beautifully depicted uh, by Lahiri in her short story that we are going to read today. And that short story is titled Mrs. Sins and it uh, is there in the collected uh, book of short stories uh, which won the Pulitzer Prize uh, titled Interpreter of Melodies. And it is to this short story that we will now turn. This story, Mrs. Sens, is narrated by an American boy named Eliot. And it tells of the time that Eliot spent with his Bengali babysitter that Eliot only knows as whom Eliot only knows as Mrs. Sen. Uh, 
Who is Mrs. Sen? Well, Mrs. Sen is a wife of Mr. Sen who migrated from Calcutta to America to take up a job to teach mathematics in a university. And this is a very crucial part of her identity. Her identity, at least in America, refers back not to something that she is herself, but refers back to her husband uh, who has a job in an American university. So, from the very beginning, we do not even in fact know the name of uh, this Mrs. Sen that we are introduced to, the first name of her. So, there is a sense of lack of identity that um, surrounds this entity of Mrs. Sen, making her slightly mysterious to us. Now, Mr. Sen has a job in a university. He remains occupied, but the migration from Calcutta to America has meant for Mrs. Sen a painful uprooting from her familiar Bengali sociocultural milieu and most importantly from her family. To fill the sense of lack that the loss of her homeland creates for Mrs. Sen, she tries to cling to the memory of the tiniest details that gave substance to her life back in Calcutta. And it is Calcutta which she still wistfully refers to as her home. In America, Mr. Sen tries, uh, sorry, Mrs. Sen tries to recreate that lost home of Calcutta by repeatedly rereading the letters that she occasionally receives from her people back home. She also listens to the familiar sounds of Indian classical music and of her relatives talking by playing cassettes in a cassette player and most importantly she tries to recreate her lost homeland through her cooking, her cooking of Bengali dishes. Now this very attempt to live the memories of Calcutta in America and uh, this attempt to transform an American space into a Bengali home creates for Mrs. Sen a cocoon of isolation that is cut off from the immediate reality outside. And Mrs. Sen's failure to come to terms with America and her conflict with the new physical reality of this foreign land is exposed in the story through references to Mrs. Sen's inability to drive on American roads. And the tension between the Bengali inner reality that Mrs. Sen creates within her apartment and the outside reality of the American roads uh, reach a breaking point when one day Mrs. Sen decides to drive herself with Elliot sitting next to her and she decides to go to a fish shop to buy uh, some uh, fresh fish so that she can prepare her Bengali dish. Now, this uh, attempt by Mrs. Sen to go and procure a quintessential item that is needed for her Bengali dish from the outside American space ends in a minor accident and neither Eliot nor Mrs. Sen is very grievously hurt but nevertheless Eliot's mother stops sending him to Mrs. Sen's and the last thing that Eliot remembers of his Bengali babysitter is the sound of crying coming out of the bedroom of her apartment within which Mrs. Sen had locked herself in. In a way, Mrs. Sen with her inability to break free from the cocoon of uh, memory of a remembered homeland and her inability to connect with the outside space resulting ultimately in a psychological breakdown represents the opposite of what Jhumpa Lahiri is. 
the diasporic author who is confident in her ability to appropriate and make her own disparate elements from different cultures. But the very fact that Lahiri creatively engages with characters like Mrs. Sen shows a desire to recognize and address the difficulty that a migrant faces in connecting with the outside reality following her displacement and uprooting. The isolation of Mrs. Sen's apartment and the sound of sobbing that comes out of her bedroom thus forms the dark underside of the diasporic condition which is otherwise marked by the luminosity of eclectic cultural possibilities. With this exploration of Jhumpa Lahiri and her work, we conclude our discussion of diasporic literature today. In our next meeting, we will take up the work of Gayatri Chakraborty Spivak, a very important theorist in the field of postcolonial studies. Thank you.